Hi, I'm, I'm Sun Bibi, a sessional lecturer in James Cook University, Singapore. So uh, really happy to be here uh, at this seminar with you. And thank you for joining us on this Friday afternoon. So uh, today we're going to be uh, having a session on writing about sustainability by Robin Hicks, who's a journalist on sustainability. So I just want to introduce that this is a seminar series organized by James Cook University called TESS, which stands for the Tropical Environment Sustainability Study Center. So they run uh, weekly seminars when the, semi when the semester is on in the university. Now, I just want to introduce Robin Kitts before I uh, uh, hand over the time to him to share with us about his work as well as his volunteer work. So Robin has been a journalist for 20 years in both online and broadcast media, working in UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, Australia, Indonesia, and Malaysia on business, con consumer, and, su and sustainable sustainability titles. And on the weekends, uh, he's actively involved in animal rescue work in Singapore, uh, which is a very vital uh, work uh, because we have a highly urbanized environment which uh, can be a threat to our wildlife. Uh, so we're all excited to hear from Robin uh, about both his uh, journalism work as well as um, his volunteer work. So over to you, Robin. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Bibi, and, and thank you so much for the introduction, uh, the invitation, James Cook University. It's a pleasure to talk to you all. So I'm going to uh, talk a bit about writing about sustainability in Asia Pacific, and also, as Bibi mentioned, um, doing a bit of res wildlife rescue on the weekends for an animal rescue charity. Um, so I, I um, volunteer, sorry, I work for my day job is for a publication, online publication called Eco Business. You can find it at eco-business.com. So we cover sustainability, sustainable development, re responsible business through the Asia Pacific lens. So I mean, broadly, we look at, we cover um, what humanity is doing to the planet, uh, what humanity is doing or not doing to try to fix the problems that, um, that we have caused. Um, so yeah, we look at, at sustainability through an Asia Pacific lens. So some of the stories that we've been covering recently, um, look at the Ukraine war, for example, and the, the impact on supply chains in Asia Pacific and food shortages. Um, also look at the energy crisis and the way that natural gas is an issue in Australia as well across the region the way that natural gas is being positioned as a, an eco-friendly transition fuel um, for us to wean ourselves off um, fossil fuels. Um, and also uh, the possibility of hazy peatland fires returning to uh, Southeast Asia. That's a big issue that we expect to unfold over the coming months as the dry season sets in. So a bit about um, eco-business. So the publication was founded in 2009 by my boss, uh, Jessica Chum. Um, Jessica was uh, a journalist at the Straits Times for 10 years, um, Straits Times being Singapore's national newspaper, but she got a bit disgruntled that the coverage in the mainstream press um, uh, wasn't, wasn't up to what it should have been and wasn't covering in depth the environmental issues of the day, this was 10 years ago, um, so she launched a publication of her own. Um, and I, I've been a journalist, as Bibi mentioned, for 20 years, I've been with Eco Business for the last five um, but my background is in science. I've got a zoology degree. So my passion, my heart has always been in sustainability and animal conservation. So I'm finally writing about what I'm, I'm really passionate about. So it's something of a, a, dream, a dream job. And I, I feel particularly lucky to do the job that I do, particularly with the state that the media is in at the moment, not just in Australia and Singapore, but um, globally that the media is not a growth industry. But sustainability is one topic that I think is actually growing. So in 2020, EcoBusiness had our best ever year for traffic. It grew by 30% year on year. And the pandemic really, I think, prompted people to think more seriously about what is happening to the planet, um, what, uh, what caused the pandemic, um, the sustainability roots the pandemic. 
Um, and yeah, and our traffic has been growing and the business has been growing off the back of that sort of wave of interest that we've seen over the past few years. Um, eco business is still niche. There aren't many uh, publications in Asia Pacific that cover just sustainability, although increasingly um, the mainstream media is covering climate more. So here in Singapore, we've seen uh, our local press um, up the ante on sustainability coverage so that they're hiring um, ESG reporters. And finally, the mainstream media is raising its game covering issues like climate change. Um, so yes, let's talk about the top stories of the day. So this is my personal view that I think the most interesting stories at the moment in sustainability that we're covering a lot are greenwashing. Now, I'm sure all of you have been bombarded as I have with uh, messages from companies, messages from governments about how green they are and what they're doing about uh, the climate crisis and other environmental issues. As you can see on the screen, there's a few stories that I've covered recently about brands that have been called out for greenwashing. And this year, especially, we've seen a, a huge torrent of the stuff. And so our coverage, we're working on a story at the moment that looks at the implications of a story that happened last week in Europe, where um, the asset management arm of Deutsche Bank, a big global bank, was the offices were raided for claims that they were making about sustainability that turned out to be false. Now, even though this, this story happened in Germany, I think it's the start of a broader trend of pushing back against greenwashing by consumers and legislators. And the story that I'm working on at the moment will look, will look at um, when will this sort of legislation come to Asia? When will legislators like the SGX or the, the, the Singapore Stock Exchange and even regulators in Australia as well, when they look to clamp down on false claims in advertising about sustainability? Because I think it's a really um, important issue that we need to tackle. Um, another, uh, if I'd say, I'd say three top stories. One that we're covering at the moment is that the Southeast Asian energy transition, which I'm sure you've a lot of you are familiar with. Southeast Asia is an interesting region in that it's the only region in the world where coal is growing in the energy mix, whereas gradually around the world that we're starting to shift away from fossil fuels. So that's a particularly alarming statistic. And the coverage you're looking at at the moment looks at um, why it is that Southeast Asia fossil fuels are so strong. Part of the reason is fossil fuel subsidies, um, energy like energy sources like coal, not only cheap in, in countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, but um, they're also heavily subsidized. So it's very difficult for renewables to get the sort of breakthrough that it needs in Southeast Asia, which is a hugely important region. So we cover that a lot. And one more of the big three stories that I think are very interesting that we're writing about at the moment is deep sea mining. Now, this is a topic that I don't think gets anywhere near the sort of coverage that it deserves. Um, deep sea mining, um, could become a huge issue, especially uh, by July next year, where um, the regulatory body for deep sea mining called the International Seabed Authority, they are primed to hand out commercial licenses for mining the deep sea. Now, um, the supporters of mining say that we need to mine the deep sea to extract metals like cobalt, manganese, nickel, copper, metals that are found that are very much needed for the energy transition. So all these metals are found in electric car batteries, wind turbines, solar panels, and pro miners argue that we need so much more of these metals to drive the energy transition um, that we have to mine the deep sea. Environmentalists argue absolutely the opposite. There's no need to start extracting um, from an ecosystem we know less about than the surface of the moon. There is no need because um, the alternatives of there is plenty of resources in land-based mining. Also, if we improve the circular economy for these metals, there'd be no need to mine the deep sea. But I think it's a particularly alarming story. If you think about the, the deep sea and the ocean depths, as I said, we, we just don't know enough about these ecosystems to go anywhere near them. Um, plus, if you start tampering with the deep sea, deep sea ecosystems, some scientists think you could, you could affect the, the very chemistry of the ocean. I mean, the ocean carries 60% of all of the oxygen that we breathe. And we start messing with that with serious implications for human health and not only the, the, the sea depths, which are um, obviously something that we can't see and that we can't monitor. NGOs cannot get down there to see whether miners are, are doing it responsibly. So those are the big three topics at the moment I think are particularly interesting. Um, that we're writing about. So challenges of the sustainability beat that, that I cover. 
Um, one is that, let's face it, sustainability is not always the cheeriest of topics. Um, it is sobering, it can be gloomy, and a lot of young people I'm conscious that are, are reading this content frankly could, could put them in a state of anxiety is that the future is um, sobering. Um, it does give us uh, cause to reflect. And that's why eco we try to mix up the stories between um, gloom and doom and, and frankly what's going to happen in the future, but also solutions. So what are some of the solutions, what are some of the tech solutions that are out there that can be deployed at scale to, to fix some of these problems that we've created? So that's a, that's a big one, the nature of contact and, and sustainability and how to get people to read this content. Um, press freedom is another issue. I'm based in Singapore, which, um, yeah, is, is, is not the freest country in the world for, for journalists. In fact, if you look at the Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index, it's some way below Russia um, to put in context what's happening now in the world. Um, so it is different. You do have to be careful reporting about certain issues based in Singapore. Um, and there is a sense that sometimes you even self-censor, or you're certainly very careful with the words that you use when writing about that sort of government and government-linked companies. Um, now, commercialization of content, where is the line? So I'll be totally upfront. So eco-business, we make our money, we're commercially, obviously commercial enterprise, and we make money from branded content. So companies that come to us pay us money to produce articles for them. They are sponsored, they do. There's a very clear logo that shows the reader that this is sponsored content. But obviously there is still a conflict there. We're, perfect, we're, we're very aware that um, we don't want to mislead the, the reader um, and we don't want to portray any falsehoods. I mentioned greenwash earlier on. There's also a risk in, the, in writing about sustainability and branded content that we are led down that path. So that's another challenge. Um, the other is the rise of corporate communications. Now, I've noticed that uh, this over the past couple of years, that anyone in journalism will, will uh, I imagine, agree. Um, the power has very much shifted away from journalism, I feel, towards companies and co uh, corporations and uh, corporate communications departments who certainly feel that entitled to lean more on journalists to try and get, the, get us to change stories. Um, and I think that's a very dangerous uh, uh, sort of environment that we're settling into because, yeah, even though we don't change stories, that there is a constant back and forth between a newsmaker or corporate communications team that's trying to control the story, um, ask, asking for questions up front. Sometimes we're asked if we can see this, that if the company you're writing about can see the story before we publish it. Obviously, we'd never do that, but the, the fact that there are, we're being asked this. Is, is, a, is, I think, quite a dangerous trend and shows that shift. I mean, the PR people at the moment outnumber journalists, I think, of as eight, eight to one globally. So that shift of, 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 of power, if you like, is something that um, we think about writing about sustainability. Right, now more fun stuff. So on the, on the I also, as, as BB mentioned, I do animal rescue um, on the weekends for animal rescue called, called Acres, which I'll get on to in a minute. So I also moonlight, so I write for local news publications about the animal rescues that I do or that my team does. So I'll just talk about quickly a, um, a story that I wrote a couple of weeks ago. So we found, forgive the, the, the rather gory pictures, sorry about that, um, but frankly, it was a gory case. So um, what you see, that the animal you see on the, the left of the screen is a kalugo, a flying lemur. And this, this, this poor animal was caught on a stretch of razor wire that was uh, in an area near the uh, Swiss embassy. Now it was the third Kalugo to get trapped on that same wire um, in a few years. Now we ran the story um, and the next day, the Swiss embassy got that wire taken down. So it does show that sometimes stories do have impact. I mean, sadly, all three of those Kalugos died. And in the hour that it took me to get that Kalugo down from that wire, it's horribly entangled with its, um, its skin membrane wrapped around that razor wire you hear. But at least it shows that after publishing that story, uh, it did have impacts because they took that razor wire down, which it was an, an awful position. It was, the razor wire was in the intersection between two nature reserves. So it's sort of like a highway for Klugos. They're always move, moving through and they swoop from tree to tree. And sometimes they're not very accurate. 
and they do get stuck in uh, the urban environment when they're outside of the tree canopy. So that story really shows the conflict in Singapore as a city in nature between um, being quite a lush and green city, but also a, a highly urban one where nature is very close to um, where people live. And sometimes there's often conflict as you see in that screen there. So a bit about um, my animal rescue organization. They're an amazing group called Animal Concerns Research and Education Society or ACRES for short. So it started uh, 20 years ago by a primatologist turned politician called Lewis Ung. Um, so Lewis, yeah, he no longer is no longer CEO of Acres, but um, and he's moved into politics. But he did start um, a 24-hour rescue operation. Um, we're very busy. Received about 20 calls a day. Um, that the we had record call volume during COVID. Uh, now I think that's because more people are out and about exploring nature reserves in and green areas. So they're more likely to come into uh, to contact with animals, and so more likely to call Acres. And the way that the way that um, our rescue operation works is that there's one person holding the phone, that's me, and there's one person driving the van. And we receive uh, calls via the hotline about animals in distress, animals that have ventured into people's homes or properties or, or that are injured. And that volume spiked during COVID. Now, the last bit of this slide is rescuing animals is the easy bit because um, Singapore, I, I think that generally it's fair to say that the the Singapore culture is, is built around convenience. It's an amazing place. It's very easy to get around, but that, that does raise expectations in terms of what the public expect of an animal rescue operation. So they expect you to be there very quickly and, and managing the public and expectations can be tricky because as, as the slide says, they've only got one hat or van for the whole island and often we get calls in different parts of the island. So it's, it's impossible to be in two places at once. So it's a, it's a stressful, but extremely rewarding. It's the best thing I've ever done. I'm not complaining about it, but there's certainly, there's certainly challenges um, to rescue. So I just want to touch on a few of the amazing animals that are in Singapore that you may be surprised that exist and are pretty much thriving in Singapore. Um, and uh, the one I want to touch on first is the pangolin, the Sunda pangolin, this incredible animal um, that looks like nothing else you'll ever see. Um, it's the only world's only scaled mammal, because I'm sure it's, it's probably famous for being the world's most trafficked mammal, which is used in um, traditional medicine. So the, the, the meat is eaten, but also the, the scales are used in traditional medicine, which according to science doesn't work, but nonetheless, it is a, a traditional custom. So, um, but yeah, despite being poached all over the world, especially in Southeast Asia and parts of Africa, in Singapore, they actually do pretty well. There's a stronghold of, of Sunda pangolins, believed to be a few hundred at least roaming around the island. Um, and it's, when you meet one, you're in the presence of greatness. They are absolutely incredible animals. They curl up into a ball when they're frightened, which makes them very easy to poach, unfortunately, and also makes them, does not protect them from cars. So as you see there on the slide, we, we, there's been a, a spike in pangolin road kills during COVID um, over the past two years, which is very alarming given that how well actually they do, do in Singapore otherwise. But there's been, I mean, there's relentless construction pretty much all over Singapore, which could be one reason. Um, also, as I mentioned, there are lots of people venturing into green areas and nature parks, which could be disturbing pangolins and the, the habitat that they usually use. Um, so, yeah, a bit of a worry about pangolins, but I, it's just worth noting that given Singapore is a, a highly urbanized um, city state that's that's lost most of its forest. I mean, there's there's 0.3 percent primary forest cover left and Singapore used to be completely forested. Um, so, but there are there are patches of forests all over the island. It's very difficult for pangolins to to navigate their way around the around the island, which is when they which is why they often fall into trouble and get run over. Sadly, um, okay. Moving on to a, an animal that does really well in Singapore, um, whereas the pangolins not particularly well adapted. The outs like the kaluga, in fact, outside of the forests. They struggle. They're just not well adapted. But but pythons. If there's one animal that does well in Singapore, I'd say it's the python. They're per they perfectly um, adapted to. They use the waterways. 
and storm drains to, to navigate the way around the island. Um, the zoo and acres runs a, a catch and release program. So, the, so the, the pythons that we do rescue, we take to the zoo, they're microchipped and then they're released back into the wild. So the zoo is monitoring where they're moving and how many there are. Um, and yes, they're doing they're doing pretty pretty well. I mean, mainly because there are lots of access routes and and uh, and ways for them to move around the island easily, and and also because there's a plentiful supply of rats. Um, what's uh, and which is ninety percent of their diet. Now, the the pythons that we we do rescue, we release back into forested areas, but we often find that the pythons come back into the centre of town. They like it um, actually in more built up areas, especially. Um, areas where there are hawker centers, restaurants, you, you usually, they're very much out of sight and they're nocturnal, so you don't see them often, but they're usually lurking underneath uh, drains and underneath buildings where there are rats. And they do, yeah, extremely well in Singapore. But sadly, um, I, I do believe they're underappreciated. We get so many calls about pythons when actually we don't need to receive calls about pythons. If people see them in the street or in a drain, it's fine for them to just to be left alone. Uh, to do their job as is free pest control. But um, as you see on the, the, forgive the alarming picture on the right, um, that's a, a, a python consuming a cat. Now pythons do eat rats, but they also occasionally eat cats and dogs, which obviously upsets people that are, own cats or dogs. Um, now the job of an animal rescue volunteer, trying to convince someone whose cat is in the a mouth of a snake is a very difficult one. Um, and trying to manage that uh, frequent uh, human animal conflict is difficult in the case of pythons because they will occasionally eat, eat a, uh, a, a, a cat or a dog. So yeah, um, this is just a garden snake. So it's amazingly beautiful um, snake. It's a paradise tree snake. They're, again, the sort of animal you think, it, Singapore is basically a city but it's still got this extraordinary wildlife and that's actually really common. This is the most common snake that we rescue, paradise tree snake, and they can fly from tree to tree so they can open their sternums, their breastplates. And then a, uh, a jet of air is cushioned uh, underneath their, their chest area and they can sort of fly or glide from, from branch, to trunk, uh, branch to branch. And they're not very accurate. So that's why often the um, these snakes are, are found in people's houses, in people's gardens. Um, and, but, but they, although they look venomous, they're very, very mildly venomous and they only eat um, lizards. So um, a lot of the time as an animal rescuer, you're trying to convince someone who's scared of a snake that they don't actually need rescuing, that they could just leave it be. But people, um, it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's one of the most common phobias in humans is the fear of snakes. So it's very difficult to persuade a, a person who's calling you not to be frightened of a, a brightly colored snake like a paradise tree snake and that they don't, they can just be left alone. Um, but yeah, that's again, a, a big issue is trying to encourage tolerance of the amazing wildlife that um, is in Singapore. Okay, so yeah, um, lots of pictures of snakes. Um, but yeah, I think snake, I, the reason I, I, I have showed lots of pictures of snakes is because they, they do cause unnecessarily often a lot of alarm and we do get lots of calls about them. So on the left of the screen is a banded crate that needs to be handled with care because it's highly venomous using those venom, venom defender gloves that you see there. Um, and on the right is a striped keelback, which is non-venomous and doesn't require the same uh, level of care. But yeah, as, as the... Um, as I say on the slide, uh, snake, the way of, if, if anyone's interested, the, the best way to handle snakes is very much to be relaxed. Snake, the snakes can feel uh, vibrations. They can sense fear as it were. So, but if you're relaxed um, and you can just hold a snake gently, um, but firmly close to the head so it can't wriggle too much, they will relax as well. Um, uh, yeah, and that does depend obviously from snake to snake. A very common snake we find in Singapore as well is a uh, equatorial spitting cobra. Now, um, they also feed on rats like, like pythons um, and they do very well in Singapore as well, you, navigating the drains like, like, um, uh, uh, like pythons do. But we need to wear uh, goggles when we handle uh, spitting cobras because they do spit and they go for the eyes and they're very accurate. 
Um, so in some cases, fear of snakes is justified, but as I mentioned earlier on, a lot of the job of an animal rescue uh, officer is trying to convince someone not to be frightened of snakes. And one of the things we started doing actually um, is trying to encourage if you go around to a, a family's house and they've got children and it's a harmless snake, is trying to uh, persuade the, the kid not to be frightened of the snake and even have a go at handling it or touching it. Um, and it's amazing how quickly fear leaves a child if you, if, you, if you talk them through it. Less so in adults, you could talk to someone uh, until you're blue in the face uh, about a, a snake not being venomous or harmful, but um, it's amazing how stubborn uh, fear can be in people. Um, but you just need to repeatedly um, try to convince people that it's just a snake. It was here before you are. It's, and, and you need to try and share the habitat with them. And that snakes are more, much more frightened of us than we are of them. And that uh, if at all possible, just uh, leave them alone to go about their business of being a very important part of the ecosystem. Okay, next slide. Yeah, as I mentioned, this is, this is related, a big issue um, that I've written about for local press and, and also eco business is issue called biophobia, um, which is a big issue in Singapore. So biophobia, the fear of, of nature, I guess, of, of, of animals, which is a, a very real fear in a city state where people generally, not everyone, but people generally are quite disconnected from the natural world. A lot of these animals you see at the, the screen here, a lot of people don't know what they are. Um, the left, you see a, a monitor lizard, um, which is scaling someone's curtains in a living room. They're often mistaken for, we get calls, people screaming about the scene of crocodile, um, which is obviously if not true. The one in the middle is, is a young hornbill that people often see, uh, call us and say, oh, I've seen a toucan, um, which are native to South America. I think we've been watching cartoons that people often learn about nature through, through other media and I haven't been taught about what the local wildlife here is at school. And on the right um, is an Asian palm civet. Uh, it's adorable thing that are often found in the roofs of people's buildings because they feed on fruit trees. And often people with landed property, we, they get call and we say that we get calls about raccoons or, or cats. So, so people, what's sad actually that, and a real issue is that people don't have that much knowledge of the amazing wildlife around them, which I do wonder, does that affect their willingness to protect um, or want to, want to help out wildlife? But I think uh, knowledge and education is, is a massive issue that, um, that it's part of the job as an animal rescuer to, to try and help the public understand um, the sort of wildlife that they're calling us about. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, yes, I mentioned because uh, up there, the city and nature. So, the, so Singapore's positioning as a city that sort of models it, it's so and sells itself to the world as a city in nature or a biophilic city. So, a biophilic city is one that is built in and around nature and green areas. And I think that's a bit of a stretch to call Singapore a truly biophilic city at the moment. It's highly urbanized, but that's nevertheless the, the ambition that the government is going for Singapore to be a city in nature. But th at the moment, there's very much this conflict between how the public generally feels about that, because with nature, you have animals like this that will ine inevitably um, encroach into people's premises and uh, come into people's gardens or, or come to people's homes. And generally, there's a, a lack of tolerance. Um, towards that happening again which I said is in conflict with that uh, city in nature ambition in Singapore. Um, so this is a pic another picture of Kalugo. We do get lots of instances where Kalugos or other animals indeed like pangolins, um, they're stowaways so they take an accidental ride on a bus. This, this went from a nature reserve to the other end of Singapore. Um, imagine what he was thinking um, as, he, as he was hanging on to, uh, to the side of a bus for for half an hour until he got to the other end of the island. But yeah, that's another issue is, uh, you know, a lot of calls that we got about this animal were completely unclear of what animal it was. So again, as I mentioned, um, uh, education's a, a huge issue to try and encourage the, the, the public to, to have a better appreciation of the nature that we try to share the city with. Now, again, forgive the graphic pictures, um, if, if I could receive a mo if the sort of call that we receive an animal rescue that's particularly disturbing, I'd say is 
is also particularly mundane in terms of how it could be fixed. It's such an easy problem to fix. One is don't use glue traps. Now these glue traps, I'm sure they're, they're available all over the place in Australia and other countries. And in, in Singapore, you can pick up a glue trap, which is designed to catch either flies, uh, small lizards or rats. Um, you can pick them up for a couple of dollars, um, if that in, in any uh, general uh, store. Uh, and they catch, they're obviously indiscriminate in the sort of animals so they catch. On the left here are two black naked orioles, which are incredible birds. Sadly, two of them were caught in a glue trap. And on the right is a, a wolf snake. It's just a, a hot, completely harmless um, garden wolf snake that was caught in, in glue traps. And we receive, I'd say, a couple of three, three calls a week, at least, about animals unintended animals getting caught in uh, glue traps and it's particularly worrying. Here you can see um, this is an adult um, equatorial spitting cobra caught in a glue trap and uh, although they can be freed what is is good about I suppose the way that we can respond to glue traps is that we can use cooking oil to gently remove um, the animal from the glue. Obviously it's a lot trickier with a, a, co a spitting cobra and we need to use venom defender gloves to hold the head in place and to gently work away um, that, uh, that glue from its body uh, with using cooking oil and then using soap to then wash off the oil before we release the, the snake or whatever animal it is back into the, back into the wild. Um, yeah, so that's a big issue, a really big issue that we face on animal rescue. Uh, another very common one, sadly, that we, we do face on animal rescue is uh, animal poisonings. Now, this is done by the local council, mostly to control bird populations. So unfortunately, in Singapore, um, people do like to do tend to complain um, about noisy birds or, or uh, high populations of birds in their neighbourhood. So uh, and in response to that, um, the council put out poison to, uh, uh, to control pigeon populations and minor populations, which are known as pest species. Uh, again, so we spend a lot of the time going around in our truck picking up, um, they look like drunk pigeons that, that, uh, that have been poisoned. Thankfully, we can actually do something about it. We can take them back to, uh, to acres and sort of force feed them a charcoal solution, which helps to flush out um, the poison from their bodies. And um, what's incredible about pigeons, they're such underrated animals, they're extremely hardy. Um, so a, a pigeon, even a pigeon that looks on death's door and that is ingested quite a lot of poison, once we've flushed out that poison, in the morning, they're good to go. And it's as if nothing happened to them. They're, they're extremely hardy animals. So um, yeah, it's good that even though when you do rescue poisoned animals, you know that there can be a solution, you can help that at least a few of them survive uh, and the survival rate um, isn't bad. So yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I'd love to, love to uh, answer any questions for any of the, you that may have them about writing about sustainability. Um, as I mentioned, it is, I do feel extremely lucky to do a job that I really love. And on the weekends do something that I'm from the UK, right? <laughs> um, we don't have the exciting biodiversity that we certainly do in Singapore. So I'm extremely privileged to try and on weekends uh, help out these amazing animals. So um, yeah, happy to take uh, any questions that anyone may have.